Serverless, that's apparently the new trendy keyword that we're having within AWS, and it gives you a lot of benefits. We always talk about all this scalability and the cloud environment, and that's beautiful. But what if we can make that even easier? What if we can say, don't even worry about service, don't even worry about auto-scaling and all that stuff. Let us take care of that. My name is Oliver Klein. I'm a solutions architect with AWS out of our greater China region. And today I want to give you an example of how we can build a mobile application without managing servers, using geospatial components, right, and matching people together. So first things first, if we talk about serverless, then generally that translates back into a service that doesn't require servers. One of this is called AWS Lambda. So what is AWS Lambda? It allows you to run your code fully managed in the AWS cloud. We take care of things like high availability. We take care of things like scale. You just put your code in, and we run it as often as you want or as little as you want. You don't need to worry about which data center facilities, which availability zone, all of that stuff fades away at any scale. At the same time, that code can be executed either way through an API call. You can say, I want to execute my code now. Or alternatively, you can have it called up through an event. And this is really powerful. This is the powerful element of Lambda where you say, instead of just calling it when I want to call it, I want to call it when something happens. I want to call it when I have something new in my storage service. I want to call it when I have a new entry in my database table, for example. That's the event-driven element of Lambda. And if, if you look at how to put it to work, that can really be a variety of things. That can be an S3 bucket. That can be a DynamoDB table where it triggers whenever somebody writes something into that DynamoDB table. It can be a synchronous invocation to the API gateway. And if you see now our Amazon Echo devices where you can talk to that device and respond back, you can create a skill, an Amazon Echo skill, with a Lambda function. You can create even complete interaction with CloudFormation templates, Amazon Kinesis real-time data processing streams, notification services, cognito triggers, etc. Now this talk is about building a mobile application. So if you were to look at um, what functionalities you want to have from a mobile application, and generally it translates into a variety of things. First of all, you want to authenticate your users. You want to know who is using your app. If they're using multiple devices, because often you have a phone, maybe you have a tablet, maybe you have a desktop PC, you want to be able to know that it's the same user across those devices. You also want to have the ability to synchronize information between those inf these devices. At the same time as you're doing this, you want to understand what your user is doing. You want to understand his behavior and react upon it. You also want to have the flexibility to run a back-end business logic. This is where Lambda comes into place. You want to store content. You want to be able to notify you know, your application into the background to mobile push notification. And you want to have the ability to store information in a database. This translates then very much into the different services that are listed here. So Cognito for authentication and synchronization between devices. Amazon Mobile Analytics to understand your user behavior. Lambda to run your business logic. Amazon S3 to store user-generated content. Amazon SNS and its mobile push notification functionality for the push notifications, and Amazon DynamoDB to store information. And to round it up, we're also going to use Amazon API Gateway to talk to some of these services. So I figured to make this a bit more eventful, how about we build a sample application, which I'm going to call the find the like sample application. And before I get into that, um, some of you might or might not have heard of an application called Tinder. Right? I'm not going to ask who, don't worry. What Tinder is, is basically an application where you can swipe people, and if they like each other, then they can talk to each other. What they do is basically they track your location, they look at you know, where you are, and they try to find people in the same vicinity, and then you can start matching them. Tinder right now, for example, is on AWS. And I wanted to give you one little stat to kind of understand what it means to build a really scalable application. Tinder right now has 1.7 billion swipes a day. Every single day, there are 1.7 billion swipes going through AWS services. Now, when we build mobile applications that are as popular as Tinder, we want to make sure that they are scalable. So let's try to build something similar. I want to build a similar app, but this time around, I want to make it a bit different. I want to say, let's build an app with that app I can tell 
I can, and I can put in my interests. I say, you know, I like to, I like AWS. I like to go hiking. Maybe I like to go wakeboarding, all right? And then I want to be notified when similar people with similar interests are in the same vicinity and they say, hey, you should meet up with Steve. Steve also likes wakeboarding, right? That's, that's the app that we're trying to create right now. So what are the functionalities that we want to look for? If we were to build such an app, we were to say, okay, I want to give the ability for people to create a profile, right? Log in their interests, take a selfie, you know, upload that into their profile. We want to have the ability to track our users continuously as they move around, you know, within Singapore, wherever they go. We want to have the flexibility then to notify users when we find someone within that vicinity, uh, you know, according to a certain interest radius that we define, and notify, hey, there's another, another person that might be interesting for you because you share similar interests. And lastly, we also want to understand how people are using this application. Those are kind of the functionalities that we want to build. And whenever I develop an application, I generally like to think of it as in layers and say, you know, let's structure it in layers and think of it in a more modular fashion. If you were to take this app, you probably could say we have three kind of different layers. The first one would be the you layer, you know, the app-centric layer where you say, I want to create my profile, I want to upload my picture, and I want to track, you know, what kind of information or how I'm using that application. And to build that layer, we're going to use services like Cognito, S3, and Mobile Analytics. Now, the next step of that sample application that we're building would be to track people continuously and also give the ability to kind of store their interests, right? This is what I would refer to as the activity-centric layer. You know, what are you doing with that application? You walk around, you change your location. You like something, you unlike something. You maybe create a new interest that wasn't there. And then the last layer that we're trying to build would be the user base centric level, right? Not only the, the you, but also the me, right? The them and me, basically. So understand everybody creates a profile, everybody has activity, and now how does that activity correlate within my user base? So this is where I now want to match people together and then alert them. So let's get started. Let's start first with the first layer. So we want to have the ability to create a profile and application, upload some of the content, pictures, et cetera, and track that usage. Now, before we can start building this, and the idea is we want to have a mobile app that directly talks to AWS services. We are not going to put any server in between. So what we need to do is we're going to need to leverage the mobile SDK to build this application, because the mobile SDK of AWS allows us to talk to certain services of AWS straight from the mobile application itself, straight from your phone, straight from your tablet. And if you look at the way AWS is structured, everything is in web service, Amazon Web Services, right? Everything is an API call. However, if you make an API call to AWS, you cannot do it unauthenticated. So any call that you make against the API needs to be authenticated. How does that procedure work? Well, generally you would have your mobile client that then says, hey, AWS Security Token Service, please provide me a token. The token service will look at, okay, what identity and access management users, roles, et cetera, do I have? What are the permissions to it? And it will then provide you with a temporary credential with which you can sign your API request and then say, now I can talk to AWS services. Now that's quite a procedure to do just to talk to AWS services, right? So how could we make that a little bit simpler? That is what Amazon Cognito is about. So Amazon Cognito actually allows you to generate those temporary credentials automatically to talk to AWS services straight from your device. And it will implement AWS security best practices around some of those access key credential rotation or lifetime. In addition, what Cognito also allows you to do is to authenticate and identify specific user within your application. Earlier I said, I installed the app on my phone. I now install it on my tablet. I want to know it's the same user. Cognito can do that for you. So Cognito can help you to authenticate that user through your own login mechanism or through some other third party authentication provider, such as Twitter, Facebook, Google, Amazon, anyone who provides OpenID or your own mechanism that you want to have. And what Cognito then allows you to do is basically recognize those users across these devices. Now, it also has one additional capability, which is referred to as Cognito Sync. 
So not only can we identify those users, but Cognito also gives you a small local storage where you can write key value pairs inside. That local storage, when I say local, I mean local to the device. So if I use Cognito Sync, I can put data into that storage and it will be stored on a file, an actual SQLite file on my device. But why would I use Cognito for that? I can't do that locally, right? I use Cognito because this will now be synchronized back to a cloud environment and will be synchronized with some other of your devices. So going back to this app, right? I'm thinking about um, my profile that I built up. So in my profile, I want to have a username or name, right? that people see me as, and then think about the app that we're trying to build. We want to match people in a certain vicinity. So I want to give the user of that application ability to say, I want to match based on a certain radius. I want to match based on 100 meters away, a kilometer away, 50 kilometers away, right? That's a preference that I would set in my app. And I want that preference to be available in all of my other devices where I would run that app. That's what Cognito Sync is about. It will store that preference file locally, it will synchronize it to a cloud environment, and synchronize it all back to your other devices. So if you were to write code to make this work, here you see Objective-C code, it would be as simple as saying, give me an AWS Cognito, create a data set, right, and now I can set key value pairs in here. So I'm gonna choose a name, my name is gonna be Ollie, and I'm gonna wanna be matched in an interest radius of 50 kilometers. Synchronize, that's it. So this information is now locally available, available in the cloud environment, and available on any future device that you're gonna use that app with. And if you think a bit beyond the application that we're building, this is very useful for any kind of mobile app you're building, even like a, a mobile game. You can save game state into Cognito Sync, and now that game state, you know, of where you left off your game will be synchronized to all your devices, for example. Now, the next thing that we're gonna do is we, gotta, we, gotta, we have a profile, we have a name, we have an interest rate, but we wanna take a picture of ourselves and upload that, right? What is the right service to do that? The right service to do that would be Amazon S3. What's Amazon S3? It's a storage service, an object storage service from Amazon that has virtually unlimited capacity, meaning you create what we call an S3 bucket, you can put in any kind of objects and it scales to virtually any amount of size of storage and, and objects that you wanna put in that bucket. So ideal to put user-generated content in here because it will also provide you with an HTTP or HTTPS endpoint to that object if you make it public, for example. So if I wanna now distribute that profile picture to other app users, I can load that straight from S3. I push my picture to S3, I'll load it back up from S3 for other users. S3 becomes like your static web server good for videos, images, JavaScript files, CSS files, you name it. Anything that's static, that belongs in S3. And your profile picture belongs in S3 because we upload it straight from our device into that service without a server in between. How do we do that? We can use the S3 transfer utility, which is part of the mobile SDK. What is that utility doing? Well, it allows you, first of all, to upload um, any kind of object like a picture in the background of the application. And it also allows you to send binary data. So I could say, for example, here's a sample code of how I would implement it in iOS. I could say my data to upload would be my picture, the binary data of the picture, and I just need to specify, hey, where do I want to upload it? In this bucket, I give it a certain name, that's the key. Um, I might give it some content type, and that's it. The transfer utility will now handle the rest. It will make sure that it's connected to the internet. It will resume the upload when you have a disconnect, for example. It will throw an exception of anything else along the line. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the next thing that I want to do is, as I build this app out, right, now I can create a profile, I can upload a picture. I also want to make sure as a developer to be able to track what's going on with my application. I want to be able to understand my users. And for that, I generally want to use analytics. And there's one service that's useful to use here, which is called Amazon Mobile Analytics, which allows you to collect, um, understand, and visualize some of your mobile app usage data. It's fully managed, so it scales to potentially billions of events that are coming in from all the different devices. But there's one important thing, which is you retain full control and ownership of that data. Amazon doesn't make any secondary use of that data. It remains your usage data. How do I get basic mobile analytics usage data? One line of code. Mobile analytics for app, sorry, AWS mobile analytics object. I give it an app ID. And now I need to talk to a mobile analytics service. 
I need to do that authenticated, right? Well, we authenticate it via Cognito, so we can just say, use that Cognito ID, and we authenticate it. What mobile analytics will then give you is basic dashboards like this, where you understand, okay, what are my daily active users, what are my monthly active users, what are the in-app purchases, what are the total session, what's the lifetime value of a user, or you even have things like stickiness factor. This is a simple metric, but this metric can be quite powerful. What a stickiness factor means is basically, if I use my app one hour today, if I use it another hour tomorrow, then the stickiness factor is the same. If I use it less, it goes down. If I use it more, it goes up. So the stickiness factor tells me if my application is popular or not so popular. If I roll out a new application version, I should always look at my stickiness factor. If it goes down, maybe I introduced a bunch of bugs so the new features are not good. And by the way, mobile analytics can lock any kind of event. So these are the ones that you get by default, but you can have much more complex and custom events that you log inside. But the reason I want to still show you some of those simple metrics is that very often simple metrics can help you to understand um, what's going on in your application. And I wanted to give you an example of a game that's called Bubble Island by Wooga. And you know, the idea is there's this little furry fox down here. It basically shoots up those bubbles, and if they're color coded, they kind of disappear. You kind of get the picture, right? What this game is, though, is that it's a level based game. And it went viral in 2012, and within two months, it reached a million daily active users, which is pretty impressive. But it then started to drop. The daily active users just seemed to disappear and slow down. So what they did was they said, how about we log a few information of our application to understand what's going on? Something's wrong. This can't be right. Why are people not playing our game? They seem to like it, right? So what they did was they just reported back a few metrics. The first metrics that they choose is every time somebody completes a level, we push that information back into the analytic service so that we can track how many tries a specific user needs to have before he passes the level, right? The more often he tries, well, the more difficult that level seems to be. And this was the result, right? And now if you look at this metric, you could probably say, mm, well, level seven seems to be pretty difficult, right? And that's probably the case. But could you now say level seven is difficult and that's why people stop playing the game? Not quite yet. So you want to correlate it with another metric. So how about we take one other simple metric? They logged one more thing, which was, what is the highest level that a user played? Right? And then you find that correlation. Now you suddenly see, hey, the highest level ever played for most people was level seven. And they tried most of the time on level seven, which then means to the conclusion, well, either way, a player played all the levels or he got stuck at a level that was too difficult. With two very basic metrics, they identified the problem. And now with, with this problem, they now can come up with a solution. And their solution was, well, if a level becomes too difficult or a player has played all levels, how about I give players new levels all the time? So what they introduced was a new level every week. And they did that right here where this arrow is striking down. And after they did that, you know, people continued to play. People continued to use their game. And the daily active users just went up and up and up because new user acquisitions were added, but the existing one, they remained on that game. So very simple metrics sometimes can lead to conclusions like this and really help you to make your product or your application or your game better. So don't underestimate the power of analytics. Now, going back to what you're building, that we're, what we're building here. So we kind of achieved the first layer, right? We, you can create a profile, you can upload a picture or any kind of you know, videos or whatever you want to have, and we already started tracking our first users of that basic app. Now the next thing that we want to do is track their location and also give them the possibility to say which interests they have, right? For this, we're going to leverage API Gateway, Lambda, and DynamoDB. So let's understand how we do that. If you think about how to collect um, location and interests. How would you normally go ahead with it? Well, you say I have a mobile application, I have a backend, logic somewhere, and then I have a database, right? Which right now, and more often than not, people build out their own server farms, or, you know, and then their own database behind it, and then they talk to it. So a better 
Our alternative to this is to create microservices based on serverless technology by using Amazon's API Gateway, Amazon's Lambda Functions, and a data store such as Amazon DynamoDB, which is a fully managed NoSQL database service. So if we were to imagine this for the specific application that we're building, you would have in Amazon API Gateway two API calls, one slash location, one slash interests. They would then subsequently call, depending if it's a get or post, uh, an Amazon Lambda function, which would be a report location function, a like new interest function, a create new interest function, maybe a list interest function. And then we need to store that information in a data store. So this would be Amazon DynamoDB right here, where we would have a location table and an interest table. Now you're gonna say, this is great, but you said geospatial. And DynamoDB, geospatial, how does that work? Well, there's an interesting trick here. And by the way, this works for any kind of database, if you wanna make it work. You can basically store geospatial information in a so-called geohash, which allows you to represent the longitude, latitude, kind of area in a string. And with the functionality of having a string, we can use any kind of database to do sorting. How does that work? Um, I don't wanna go into too much detail, but basically, uh, if you were to imagine a concept, imagine the world would be like a cube, you know? We kind of build a cube around the world, and then we say every side of that cube, we label it A, B, C, D, E, F. And then we take that individual side of that cube, which is now a square, and we divide that square in child squares, in child cells, one, two, three, four. And those child cells, again, we divide them and we divide them. So child cell two would be two, one, two, 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 three, two, four, and so on, and so on, and so on. Which now allows us to say, you know, we divide all these things. If we want to have a certain specific area, so let's say, for example, this red dot here. How would we know where it is? Well, it's a, ch a child cell of a child cell of a child cell of that cube. So this would be a two, two, four. And what this means now is I can create a string that gives me a position, but it also gives me a square. And the longer that string, the more granular my position becomes. The shorter that string, the more I zoom out. Now, if I now want to know, well, who's surrounding me, right? I just need to query who's A22 or A2 and I find all the people within that square, which now allows us to use any kind of database technology that allows basic string manipulation, which would be pretty much everything, to store geospatial information. And that's what we're gonna do with DynamoDB, because DynamoDB has indexes, and indexes that allow sorting based on string prefixes. So now we can, based on a string prefix, define who's in a certain area. Now you're gonna say, that's all cool, but I don't wanna build that. No problem, we got you back on that. There's actually a library that we, um, that we have on our AWS Labs GitHub page, slash github.com slash AWS Labs slash DynamoDB um, hyphen geo, which is a Java library to easily create and query those geospatial, and, uh, 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 sorry, geo hashes from DynamoDB. So here's an example. Uh, Amazon is a company that is headquartered in Seattle. In Seattle, you have a wonderful little landmark that is called the Seattle Space Needle. Seattle Space Needle is at those exact longitude, latitude coordinates that you see here. So what I could say, I, I could say, create a new geo point on the Seattle Space Needle, and now I wanna know what do I have in my DynamoDB table, what's surrounding the, the, the Seattle Space Needle 250 meters away. I just say, create a query radius request with a value of two, 250 meters, and then query that radius, which will now go to DynamoDB, query that index, find the places that are 250 nearby, and return them. And because it's Java, we can run it in Lambda, right? Because Lambda supports Java. So great, we got that figured out. Now, I just wanted to dive a little bit into the API gateway part. Because you might say, could I call a Lambda function straight from my mobile device? And the answer is yes, absolutely. But I plugged in API gateway, so why did I do that? What is Amazon API gateway? Amazon API Gateway is a fully managed and scalable RESTful API Gateway service that is channeled through our 54 edge locations across the world. There's a typo, it should be 54. 54 edge locations across the world. So that's your first entry point into the API network. The important part here is we provide a distributed denial of service attack protection around it, a DDoS protection around it. So if somebody tries to attack you, you have API Gateway in front of it, 
fine. Then it's Amazon's problem to solve that, not yours. At the same time, if you have abusive users, you can start throttling them because API Gateway gives you those throttling capabilities. It also gives you the capabilities to create multiple stages where you say, I have a development environment, I have a test environment, I have a production environment. I move my APIs between stages. But let's take it one step further. Why is it really important for a mobile application? Again, I could call that Lambda function directly, but what that means is I need to know in my application what Lambda function I'm calling. So if tomorrow I want to decide to change the Lambda functions, I need to change my application code, which means I need to recompile it, publish it, and push it to the App Store, to the Google Play Store, et cetera, and hope that people are updating the application. So that's not good. That's why we plug API Gateway in between, because now we have an interchangeable front door to all of our backend logic. And we can kind of navigate around. That's our front door. We never change that. That slash location is always the same. But we can now change wherever it goes in the backend. We also then have this entire protection around it, right? That goes, by the way, from network layer attacks like Synflots all the way up to application layer, to your HTTP requests. And we throttle those individual users who we might not, you know, who might be abusive towards our system. One other thing is, think about those lists of interests that we have in the application that we're building, right? Everybody can create an interest, and then we have a, a listing of all those interests. What you could do is we can cache some of those interests so that we don't always need to get them from the database. With the API Gateway service, you get that caching functionality. So some of your API calls that maybe just load information back in could have it cached at the edge location. That's pretty cool. And if you build a web app, by the way, you can also enable cross-origin resource sharing fairly easily for any app of your desire by plugging API Gateway in, in front of it. So what have we achieved? We create an application where we can create a profile, we upload a picture, we understand the usage, we allow people to hack in their interests, put in their interests, and we track their location as they move around, store that in, via a geohash in the DynamoDB table. Now, here comes the juicy part. How do we now find matches between those people, and how do we then notify them? And here is really where the event-driven capabilities of Lambda came in, come in. If you think about what we currently have done, we have a DynamoDB table. That DynamoDB table is getting filled with location, with locations, with geohashes. It's getting filled with interests of people liking or disliking an interest or creating a new interest. We have information coming in into our S3 bucket, new profile pictures that people upload, maybe new videos, etc. We have people using our application. When they use our application, they authenticate via Cognito. So we have profile information coming in into Cognito, new usernames, new interest radius that we set on how we want to match people. These are all events that are coming in. And what we can now do is to say Lambda can be triggered with those events. So as things change in my DynamoDB table, it calls a DynamoDB stream, which can call a Lambda function. As I have new objects in my S3 bucket, I can have an S3 event notification that triggers a Lambda function. As I change my profile information in Cognito, it's going to call a Cognito sync trigger, which calls my Lambda function. So if I were to say I want to find proximity matches based on interest, how would I now build that with this kind of knowledge that I now have? I have my application, right, makes a RESTful API call against my location. Every time I move around, I want to store this new information, which calls a report or invokes a report location lambda function, which in effect stores that in a DynamoDB table using geohashing capabilities. Here's where the event-driven part now comes in, because now we have a DynamoDB stream that can call another Lambda function. So every time we have new locations that come in, we can call a Lambda function that does nothing else but checks, do we have a match? How can that Lambda function do that? Well, it has access to the interest table, which knows you are person X, Y, Z, you like this and that and that, and here are other people that are nearby and like the same thing. And how do I know how far I match? Well, I get that information from a profile setting that is not only locally stored on my device, but also on the Cognito Sync store on the cloud to which Lambda now has access. And now you're going to say, well, that's great, but you know, what if I like a new interest, for example? Then it wouldn't match anymore, right? Well, how do I do that? Well, think about the process of it. That's an API call against slash interest, which calls, in effect, the like interest Lambda function which then writes that new interest into a DynamoDB table, 
which then triggers a DynamoDB stream, which can call the same find match function. And how would such a DynamoDB stream Lambda function look like? Well, relatively simple. You would just say, you know, for uh, you create a function, and you say for every new event that comes in, you process it. And what is that event, that record that comes in? That record is that new, we call it an image, that new image, that new item that is in that DynamoDB table that somebody just inserted. So we find that new image geohash, and then we can use that to see if we find people in that location. Now we're gonna say, okay, good, now we know we have a match. What are we gonna do next, right? So the next thing that we wanna do is we wanna notify other people, right? We wanna notify, hey, there's another person that is in your location that seems to share similar interests, right? So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna use mobile push notification to do that. And therefore, we're gonna leverage Amazon SNS mobile push notification capabilities. Amazon SNS is a notification service that can notify multiple endpoints, things like API endpoints, email endpoints, etc. But it also has one capability, which is the mobile push capability. So it can push, not push notifications across any kind of platforms, Apple's, Google's, Android, iOS, Baidu in China, Amazon's uh, Fire devices, Windows devices, etc. And, and fan it out, fully managed to any kind of scale. It also allows you to create multiple topics. So you could say, for example, a certain topic, I create a topic for Singapore, or maybe I create a topic for Kalang in Singapore, and then I want to send a message to all those people, I just send a message to that one specific topic. So let's go back to what we're trying to build, right? We want to notify the user when we have a match. So we have our DynamoDB streams that trigger the find match function. If the find match function now so happens to find someone who you match with, what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna use Amazon SNS to send a mobile push notification to the one or two people that you now have matched with. And that's again an AWS SDK call that comes from your Lambda function. Now the next thing that you're gonna say is, well that's great, now we got that working, but what if I change my profile? Because right now, I've said I wanna match on 50 kilometers radius. Now, in Singapore, that's pretty much all Singapore, I guess. So what if I want, I want to say, I only want to match people who live in Chinatown, so I bring this down to maybe two kilometers, right? So I change that setting on my phone, locally. What will Cognito, sing, what will Cognito do? Well, it's first stored on this disk on this phone. But now it gets synchronized to a cloud environment so that we can synchronize it for other devices. But that sync can also be a trigger for a Lambda function. Right? So when I now change that profile setting on my phone locally, the moment it syncs, it can call a Lambda function. And that Lambda function could now say, well, I want to know if I should reevaluate if you found a new match. How do I do that? Well, when that Cognito Sync trigger comes in, I say, look at that data set that comes in, and look if there was a replace operation, because replace means I changed it. I slide it to a different kind of interest radius. If there's a replace operation, I need to reevaluate. Do we have matches? Now, how are we gonna evaluate if we have matches? Now what you could do is we have this find match functionality, right? Now what every good developer will do, he will go to that find match function, he will click on it, he will hold his mouse button, he will select everything, he will say control, copy, and he'll paste it in here, right? That's what a good developer will do. Not really. So what we rather do is we want to reuse that find match lambda function that we already have to re-evaluate in this function that is um, triggered by the Cognito sync trigger. So what we can do is we call a lambda function within a lambda function. Now it's not quite inception yet, it's really just asynchronous calls. How do we do that? Well, again, it's an SDK call. A, fa a lambda function can call another lambda function just by an SDK call, and that's exactly what we're doing here. We basically just say, hey, take the find match function, and I give one invocation type here, which makes it asynchronous, right, which basically says, do it, and then shut down this function, and I invoke it, and that's it. Now I reuse my code of the find match function, which now gets called only when somebody changes his profile. Right? So I reevaluate my matching func uh, my, my, uh, if I matched with someone when I change my profile. So if you were to look what we've achieved, we really accomplished all our layers now. And the final architecture would then 
look like this, where we say we have a mobile application, it's using the mobile SDK to talk to Amazon Cognito, authenticate itself. Now we have the flexibility to talk to other AWS services, such as, for example, the API Gateway, such as, for example, Amazon S3, so we can upload our profile picture. With the API Gateway, we can all Lambda function to report our location, our interests, which is stored in a DynamoDB table. That DynamoDB table has DynamoDB streams attached to it, which can call a Lambda function to define if we have found a match. If we have found a match, we're going to push, send a mobile push notification back to the SNS service, back to the mobile application. And what we now build is an app that, if nobody uses this, costs nothing. But it will grow with your user base, and you only get charged for exactly what you use. It's designed to be highly available, highly resilient, scales to any kind of capacity. And the cost that, uh, that you have associated with, the, with this is only based on the usage pattern that you have of your application, which is perfect for applications that have kind of variable workloads, all without managing a single server. That's all I have. I thank you very much all for your attention. Thank you.